Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome to the show card reader, tarot teacher, podcast host, and writer T. Susan Chang. Susie is the author of the recently released Tarot Correspondences, Ancient Secrets for Everyday Readers. She joins us today to talk about what else but tarot. Susie, welcome aboard. So good to be here, Gordon. Oh, indeed, indeed. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. And, uh, of course, before we get to talking about the book, we have to uncover... Susie, were you a weird kid? (laughs) You know, I've been listening to your show for, I don't know, three or four years now, and every time you ask, I ask myself that. And uh, I'm still not sure I have a definitive answer, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, So, I think that I probably was, but I kind of... I grew up in uh, in suburban New York, just outside the city, and uh, so strong Asian American family, but a little bit of a weird one because we were we were early. My parents came over, um, you know, sort of in the forties and fifties, and because their parents were highly politically active and in trouble, so um, so yeah, so they got established there in New. York. Both of my parents were actually artists. So, you know, we didn't have any kind of religious upbringing. We didn't have, you know, anything particularly unusual going on. But if you grow up in an artistic household, <laughs> you know, it's it's magical nonetheless. So, um, my parents were both visual artists and my sister and I were both musicians. Oh, cool. So, yeah, yeah, that's kind of how it worked. A few pieces um, fell into place there because, uh, you know, musicians and mathematical mindset and, and creating an entire large book of tables and, and so on is, <laughs> is all kind of in the one. Um, it, 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 it's expressions of a similar personality. Yeah, there's something going on there. There's definitely something something going on there. And so we, we were neither encouraged nor did Encouraged from doing anything weird, but um, but at the same time, you know, somehow there was that sort of immigrant immigrant drive to do things to achieve, you know, and try mm-hmm. to be nice and you know and fit in and all of that. So I really kind of towed the line for a really long time. So you know, I went straight through uh, school. I, the musician thing. I was at Juilliard actually as a pre-college student in piano for uh, eight years, I think, before uh, graduating both high school. Wow, that's Juilliard. that's very immigrant. That that's that's <laughs> imp- and also <laughs> impressive, but yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there's like a there's like a whole community of like Asian American kids from the '70s who went to Juilliard and then went to Harvard and then did whatever they were going to do, and that's just you know that's that was where I was. That was my community. So, um, yeah, and it just was normal, you know? Sure. I mean, it isn't because people don't, (laughs) people don't sort of go to Juilliard at 13 or whatever. Like that, that's, that's not normal, but it's, yeah. 10 actually. Yeah. It was, it was a very, it was a very weird sort of thing to do. And, uh, and definitely, well, you know, and I think it was a really good thing to do for me in a way, because, you know, um, I, was very used to not being that much of a hot shot. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I didn't become a musician because 
I just didn't have it, you know. I mean, you can only have so many recording artists in the world, and uh, I was not one of them. So, you know, it's good to confront that. No, when it's, you're young. that's a really good sort of self awareness. I mean, uh, one of my favorite <laughs> Seth Godin books is is called The Dip, and it's basically if you're not going to be the best in the world at something, do something else. <laughs> Um, and that, and, and, and it, that's a, that is a strategy for success, for success. Like he says, if, and wouldn't it be nice though, if someone would hand you something at, you know, at age, maybe 10 would be nice. You know, a slip of paper says what you're going to be the best at. <laughs> sure. Sure. But, um, I mean, I think basically what he has there is a shortcut to success because by the same token, if you tell most people who are kind of like musicians in their bones, um, they won't care. Like, no, no, no. I, I, I do music, and if, and if I die in the gutter at age sixty-eight, then that's just, that's my life. That's what happens because I can't well, not exactly. do music. Um, but there's, exactly. it's, it's, there's a level of self-awareness and, and, and an interest in, in success and going. Do you know what? I'm not going to be the best at this, so I'm going to zig rather than zag. <laughs> Well, you know, I think there's that and then there's the opposite lesson, which is at some point you sort of uh, say, fuck it, I don't care if I'm the best. Yeah. You know? Well, so that was going to be my follow up question when you said that is, did you find, do you find music more enjoyable now that you, now that it doesn't have to do something for you? Oh, Gordon, there's so much up in there, you know, I mean, every once in a while I'll go back and, uh, and I'll play and it's you know, it, it, it pulls at my heart, you know, to, I did have the chance to do it for pleasure for a while. Um, you know, actually that whole period of my life was such a clusterfuck because my mom died when I was 14. And then, you know, the whole music thing was just another, uh, easy mishmash in my brain. But, but for a couple of it wasn't early enough and it wasn't big enough. Mm -hmm. And after that, you know, years later, I kind of came back to music in various forms. I learned the saxophone at one point, uh, picked up, you know, I'm always sort of messing around here and there. Every once in a while, I'll, um, I'll go into a massive uh, sort of re-exploration of, and sit down with the piano and then completely overdo it. So, you know, I, I can't say that I've come to any sort of temperate uh, mind frame about it, but, uh, but I have hope. But, it's, but it's, it, it means it's fun now, right? Like you can do it because you want to. Um, or not. It's, yeah, it's sort of it's 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 not fun is probably not quite the right word. It's it's sort of like a sort of a seesaw of desire and compulsion kind of uh, thing. But, uh, I understand you even better now, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So before yeah. we talk about the tarot, we've been corresponding um, via the member email a little bit, and I have to ask, <laughs> what's with the ancient Greek? Oh yeah, so that's what I studied at Harvard. Um, so I um, I went there directly after high school in Juilliard, and uh, and I started in on. Um, well, I actually double majored. I started as a sophomore, and I double majored in Greek and English. The English was just because I don't know. It was sort of like I don't know what you do here. <laughs> Guess I'll do that. And then the Greek was because I'd kind of gotten interested in it in high school. Um, you know, and and there was like a thread of weirdness that I suppressed all through my childhood. And Greek was sort of an extension of that. You know, there was a period uh, where I walked backwards all the time. I've kept a diary every day since I was 10. Oh, you cool. Know, I used to. God, I wish yeah. I'd done that. Yeah, nice. <laughs> well, no, that's exactly the thing, Gordon. You know, I said to myself when I was 10, I said, well, I don't really care if this is any good, but it'll be great if I just do it every day. <laughs> so I just did it every day and I still do. So I figured, you know, I didn't know who Samuel Pepys was, but he would have been an, an inspiration if I'd known about him. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and I did the the sort of normal things like people in our tribe do, I would build sandcastles and name them in Elvish kind of stuff. Of course, of <laughs> yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. And do you think, I mean, have you sort of sat with whether the ancient Greek was uh, a sort of foreshadowing or calling? Like, was, what was, was there something resonant about the philosophy or mythology or any of that kind of stuff from the kind of classical world that, you, that was, uh, was compelling for you? Yeah, it was something about the language. Um, I like languages. I haven't had the opportunity to um, really master and uh, use them. But 
you know, but I, but I really like languages. And when I was little, I used to sit with the opera libretto, you know, and listen to the opera and read all four languages in the libretto while I was listening, because that was, that was my idea of really fun. So, you know, when I got to Greek, I just, I loved the sound of the language, and I liked the structure. And it was kind of weird and everything you said in it sounded magical oh well yeah. you've you uh <laughs> your delivery so for people obviously no one will know this because it was an email between us but you sent me a link to the hermes Cthonios uh orphic hymn in in the lead up to halloween which i actually used that night uh Did it, you really? yeah 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 so i i sort of big up the as you do big up the ancestral altar at the hearth um for that night and i was thinking how am i gonna how am i opening ceremony here uh and obviously <laughs> there's the usual stuff the, the prayers and, and cleansing and so on i just i picked up my laptop and it's sort of in the kitchen fireplace area right and i um had the incense and the candles going and it was dark and, and whatever and then i i just hit play on the youtube video and it was really potent so um <laughs> I, but i can Fantastic. hear i can hear in your delivery that you delight in the sound of the words. I do. And, you know, it, it means a lot to me be, to be able to use it after all these years, because, you know, I thought it was just yet another sort of, you know, humanities degree down the toilet kind of thing. But it really gives me joy to be able to use it and to sort of understand it, you know, just enough is really a thrill. And actually, so this last year, over the last year, I... I committed to memory all of the Orphic hymns to oh, the cool. planets, to yeah. the seven planets, so I could use them in ritual every day. And that's been, that's been great, because I feel like I'm talking to them, you know? Well, it, it, they did speak that language, so you probably are. <laughs> uh, are but yeah, the Chthonic, the Chthonic Hermes one is an absolute barn burner. Oh, I had never heard it before in its Greek, obviously. Um, and yeah, it, it's really good stuff. We Remind me, we'll make sure it's in the show notes so other people can go and have a listen as well. I think that's a good idea. So let's talk tarot, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, very much one of my favorite things. And I guess, Susie, tell us the story of how you first found the tarot. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so this was in... 1997. I checked my diary. <laughs> oh, of course. Well, that's what they're for. That's what they're for. I mean, if not, if not for this, what on earth would I do it for? So, um, so yeah, that was in May of 1997, and uh, I was working for oh, I think it was Oxford University Press at the time. I kind of went back and forth between Oxford and Cambridge University Presses. I was uh, literary studies editor. I did uh, literary theory, classics, African American studies, American studies, whole grab bag of stuff. Anyway, so um, I had my only familiarity with tarot at that point had come from. The girl next door in college. And, uh, you know, I was just sort of like normally fascinated the way people are with tarot, just because like, you know, you're in an academic environment, everyone's stressed out and hormonal. And it's sort of like you look over and there's this mystical thing happening kind of seems like it might solve all your problems. <laughs> but, uh, but so, you know, I would visit her and but I never really thought I would do it for real. That was just like, too, too far out. So, uh, so in 1997, though, what was going on was that I had, um, I was working at home. I remember that weekend. It was beautiful, sunny weekend. And I was, as usual, reading somebody's revised dissertation and, <laughs> and uh, trying to turn it into, well, it was written in the language I call English as a second language in the absence of a first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, uh, and I was trying to make it into English again. And, uh, and I was sitting there with my pencil and I just threw the pencil across the room. And I said, you know, there's got to be more to life than this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I think it was sort of at that moment that I realized it was sort of all around that period. Me living from the neck up was really not working. And uh, that something needed to happen. Um, so, tarot was part of that. I started doing a lot of different things that I'd been hesitant to do before. I started ballroom dancing, which I did like three or four hours a night <laughs> because can't do anything by halves. And uh, I started uh, as aforementioned uh, saxophone thing. Uh, and then, and I decided to get a tarot deck. I wrote in my diary that day that I, 
I just couldn't live with any more uncertainty, which is a really controlling thing to say. And I don't know why I thought tarot would solve that because it doesn't. Um, it just helps you, in my opinion, negotiate your relationship with uncertainty. But um, but yeah, so that's I went and I bought it at the Barnes and Noble. That's that's all that happened. And so, uh, I mean, did you stand there? Were they in the glass cabinet like they oh, usually no. were? No, it was just, uh, I can't even remember. It was completely mundane, Gordon. You know, it was just like on a shelf. <laughs> and which one, which one did you pick? I just got the Rider Waite, like okay. everybody, do, well, like so many people do, the 1971 Rider Waite. And, uh, you know, garish cartoon style and all. And uh, took it home, and I took it out. And I remember sitting at my table and just sort of holding them. And something happened that... I couldn't quite explain at that point. I started feeling, I don't know, like a, I kind of described it as a buzz, you know, an electricity running through my hands as I was holding the cards. And, you know, I really didn't know what to make of it, but I took that as uh, an indication that something was happening. <laughs> and. and now, in retrospect, I can look back and I can see that trying to read tarot, that whole journey that started that day, was about me recovering myself, reconnecting my body and my mind, reconnecting a sense that I was not separate from the world, not, not just a brain drifting around in space, yeah, mm. you know, but part of a living universe. And... Uh, it took me a long time to sort of recognize that that's what happened, but now I see it for what it is. Now, I haven't, I've had tarot people on the show before because um, I obviously love talking about it. I haven't asked anyone this question. So that's the story of your first tarot deck. How long mm -hmm. before you got your second? And when was it that you kind of had, which most tarot nodes do, the realization <laughs> that I can have as many decks as I want. Like, I can kind of remember that moment because I, I, my first deck I had for probably about 11 months and then I got the next one and then I just saw it and I said, oh, that looks kind of fun as well. And somewhere around the three-year mark, I'm like, there's actually no upper limit except storage <laughs> space for how many I can get. So, could, do you remember what your second deck is or you need to check the diary? Oh, and, yeah, and, no, and, no, know. I actually do remember, but it wasn't quite as... You know, it wasn't quite as straightforward as it may have been for you. I'm probably, I've got a maybe a decade on you, so things were not quite as available. But, um, but I do remember that my second deck was a Thoth deck. And uh, my friend, I went with my friend, again, to the, uh, the, the aforementioned Barnes & Noble, and, uh, and, bought the, and she bought the Thoth deck for me because she'd picked up on that ridiculous myth that you can't buy your own All tarot right. deck. So yeah, she yeah. bought it for me. So um, yeah, and uh, and I had a look at it, and I gave it a I gave it a good college try, <laughs> but never, I could never really not. Done it for I me. could not. I couldn't make it go. Now I can, but back then, mm -mm. yeah. And then, yeah, and there wasn't much. There wasn't a whole lot of internet back then, so you know, it was just sort of getting going. You could kind of look around, and you could every once in a while you could see a deck review or something like that, but it really wasn't until, you know, it, I didn't start going absolutely bananas until probably a few years ago, really, because that's when I kind of came creeping toe by toe out of the closet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, The Thoth one was sort of fairly early on for me. I've never bought a Waitsmith. Smith. Um, I can't. Really? Yeah. Oh, no, not the original. I mean, most of my decks are, you know, Waitsmith derived. They're not uh, Marseille or whatever. But um, no, mm -hmm. I've never, I, I don't like it. Uh, but I, I like it slightly better than um, the Thoth deck. I, I, I can get it to work as well. I just don't see why I need to put in the effort when I have other ones <laughs> that work better. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I guess it just depends what, you know, what what image set has colonized your brain. I remember that you were talking to Benabel about uh, decks in one interview, and she said that, you know, the, the, the Wade Smith is the deck that she could read dead drunk. And I kind of feel like that about it, you know. Yeah, but sure. there's a thing also that I think about tarot decks is that how much you like the aesthetics doesn't have that much to do with how well they read. Have you noticed that? Um, 
I would say that's the case. So uh, we were in the emails we were talking to before, uh, we're going backwards and forwards because for people listening, I was unwell. So I had to sort of schedule this for another day. Uh, I think, I guess there's probably something to that because I've spent the year trying to get the Lenormand to work for me. And that's when I've been doing um, playing card stuff and, and whatever. So I, it's been a fairly tarot light year for me. So mm -hmm. yes, but because what I want to talk about eventually is, is meanings and where they come from. I guess my mm -hmm. qualifier there would be if you get, and this is why I'm, I know people think this is tacky, um, but if you get a themed deck, if you pick the theme correctly, I think that works as well because you have an additional sure. symbol set. So yes is is the answer to that. But it's not um, that I – so, for instance, going back to the Thoth or um, Waite Smith, it's not necessarily just that I don't like the images because actually I quite like them. But, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, I think There's if, something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think you're weird. right that because I, and I learned this. Uh, I've taken a couple of Camellia's classes, right? And um, she says she mm -hmm. likes the cleanest possible ones because she's got this Zen attitude. She's like, I don't like any theme decks. I don't like any <laughs> of the sort of elaborate pictures. And I'm like, no, oh, but I do. And anyway, I buy the decks for the course that she, she runs you through. And you go, oh, what do you know? <laughs> it, yeah, it works. Well, I, there's also <laughs> definitely a, a, a philosophy that many tarot people ascribe uh, subscribe to that you know the older the purer, don't believe that at all. I mean, I sort of think that after you read tarot for a while, you're not, of course, you're always looking at the surface of the card, but you're also kind of looking through it, you know? And sometimes I'll just use my friend Mel, who my co-host at Fortune's Wheelhouse, she gave me a set of dice, you know, one 22-sided dice, a couple of four-sided dice, you know, a plus and minus dice. And so that's tarot, right? So sometimes I'll just throw those and that's my reading. <laughs> mm, cool. <laughs> you know? And well, I think you can do that. Well, this sort of brings us to an interesting question. Um, so your first was Wade Smith. Um, mm -hmm. Would you recommend for people, it's extremely unlikely anyone listening to this does not currently possess a tarot deck, but let's pretend they, they don't. What is your recommendation for first ever tarot deck? I would, well, I've been telling people, because I now have a class uh, called The Living Tarot. It's on my website where I'm teaching people to read tarot. So I'm actually recommending Wade Smith. Um, and I'm recommending that people use whichever version uh, is easiest on their eyes. <laughs> um, I personally like the uh, Pamela, Pamela Coleman Smith commemorative edition. It's a little bit more muted. It's uh, doesn't, the yellows don't uh, assault your retinas the way the uh, the 1971 edition does so you know a lot of people say no don't start with wade smith it'll ruin you for life start with the marseille deck i think that's asking too much i really do that's um, a good point it, it depends how that's a good point because i would um i use if i'm using tarot which i haven't done that much this year it's always been the marseille and I've, i have a few years under my belt as well and i, I do think it is a bit you that's a good point i think if if, if for beginners Wade Smith is potentially more invitational or less austere in, in it expecting you to do everything. Exactly. I mean, I think Marseille, it's a, when I use Marseille, it's a completely different style of reading. In fact, I'm using, uh, this week I'm using the um, Pablo Robledo uh, Marseille deck this whole week. And, and I love it, but, um, but you really put a different brain on yeah. when you use it. Yeah. And, uh, and it's much more, it's much more, of tension and release um you have to do a lot more uh i think it helps to be a much more visual person uh rather than a person who operates on languages and codes and symbols <laughs> um i don't know i don't know there's something about it that's that's i think it's entirely possible to get uh very powerful readings but you know it's going to be a lot of those pips are going to be really hard for a lot of people and there's a reason that many marseille readers only use the majors yeah. Um, well, I, that was going to be one of my questions, actually. So, what's your opinion on separating out pips and trumps uh, if you're in a sort of fortune-telling situation in particular? I mean, is that something you do that often? Because it kind of activates my OCD a bit. I don't like doing it. <laughs> no, I don't like it. I don't even like taking out a significator. I like the right? randomness of the deck to be <laughs> completely complete and unadulterated. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, what I, I yeah. did force myself this year again, because I've uh, 
My backstory with the Lenormand is I've never been able to really get it to work until this year, but I could always get the Sibylla to work. And the Sibylla is essentially a variant of it. And I couldn't understand that. Ah, you know, I, so when you mentioned that, I, I actually got, I Amazon primed myself a set of Sibylla uh, cards to check them out. And uh, they came a couple days ago and I've been playing with them a little bit. Um, they're, they're really charming. They're good. Um, they're quite, I don't know which one you have, but it, I noticed this year they're actually the, uh, extremely sexist. Okay, yeah. They're also quite sexist in the, in the depiction <laughs> of women, which I never really noticed before. But it's also, it's just much more Italian. There are more negative cards about arguments or being robbed on the street or whatever. <laughs> and so I think that's why it works better for me because it, it, better encompasses the range of fortunes and misfortunes that you can encounter in life. But my great realization this year has been, oh, wait a minute, the traditional Lenormand is 36, but the Sibylla is a full playing card deck. So at the beginning right. of the year, I got the Maybe Lenormand, um, which in that weird twist. Beautiful. Effect, Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one that is a full deck of cards. So I've been able to do that. Coming back to the pips, one of the ways I sort of trained myself into getting the Lenormand to work for me was I would do some pip only only readings to to sort of be essentially like um be essentially like playing cards so that was going to be one of the things that i was going to ask like do you do that for any reason um i just did it mostly so i could kind of get my head i yeah I, it, this is what it took to get into lenormand it took um <laughs> thinking sibylla and then adding some pip practice and then now now i'm actually i, I think the lenormand is like my favorite thing at the moment i think it's amazing yeah i i hear what you're saying Ah, uh, yeah, Lenormand, you know, it's it's quite wonderful. I, I thought I'd kind of seriously get into it, and then I never did. But I, I gave it a go. Um, and, you know, actually, I don't know if you – you probably didn't see this on my website, but on election day, because I was – so incredibly antsy and couldn't settle down to anything. I, I took out every divination tool I have. <laughs> I took out Lenormand. I took out, uh, I took out runes. I took out I Ching. I took out like two Oracle decks and, you know, and tarot. I did, I had like eight methodologies going and, uh, and I, and I, and I used every single one of them to see how it would go. Uh, not that I actually think that I'm not sure there's a uh, mundane tarot practice in the same way there's a mundane as astrology practice. I'm not even sure that idea works, mm. but I thought, you know, what the hell, let's give it a go. And well, I actually think I did pretty well. Well, how do you think they work? How do you how think do it works? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do Because I know exactly what you mean. Uh, I'm not sure... I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, it, from a divinatory perspective, I'm not sure if we can... I mean, because uh, like you, I, my readings are more often than not alarmingly accurate. Like, they seem to know mm -hmm. better than me what's happening. But as a result, in a funny way, that's not that good a divinatory tool because you should get clarity about what you what is going to happen. But you look at it and go, oh, okay, I guess this is going to happen. And then an event that better matches the cards materializes in your life. And so, how, I mean, like, how do you think, what's going on with cards? What's happening there? Well, a couple things, a couple different thoughts going on with that. I mean, first of all, you know, I think that when we, when we read cards, it is super tempting to get really, really fatalistic. And that's something I fight all the time because you know because you've seen so many things happen with uncanny eerie accuracy that it kind of puts you in this headspace but i think it's really important not to give into that um before i answer your question further uh can i ask you a um oh i call it a dumb question about a smart subject about fate and free will mm -hmm. um so this is the question i've been asking everybody lately which is Okay, um, if you have a dial where zero is everything is fated and 10 is uh, your free will is uh, all powerful, uh, where, do you, where do you place that dial? I, you, can, you can reject the question if you like. In a way, I probably would just because uh, free will is this not very well articulated notion in the 21st century because it's sort of tumbled through um republicans in the 20th century and nietzsche and then back into enlightenment philosophers and 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 it it has an understanding of the mind and and human agency that i don't think is a good match for what's actually going on or i'm not aligned philosophically with it so mm -hmm. i weirdly the fate thing uh, 
it's just sort of insufficiently animist to go uh, like there's something very imperial about going ah oh, free will it's my will to do everything i like the term agency better but agency mm-hmm. allows me to be a polyform it allows different thoughts that are or aren't my own to be part of that process cosmically however um if you're talking about which things are fixed in one's life and and which aren't and can you break them i think mm-hmm. my most in the 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 cosmology i find the most interesting for that is probably from the classical era emerging out of egypt where you do have the idea that if you don't do anything to amend your fate it's particularly your astrology right uh, if you don't mm-hmm. do anything to amend your horoscope then it will basically be 100% accurate however there are techniques to amend it and this is what the pharaoh was for in pharaonic egypt he would actually go above the planets and and match to the stars and essentially come down as a god in whatever kind of stellar configuration he needed to and that democratized into different forms of magic and 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 so on in the classical era and astrology and and what have you so i actually think um fate is inertia and not that many people alive do anything but ride the inertia so that's where i mm. that's where i put it so i i think mm. fate is essentially fixed unless you do something about it mm. that's a really interesting answer although when you say you know 100% accurate you know what even am accuracy oh sure sure but i mean right? i think you you get this kind of metaphor um even just metaphorically i think it works which is people who just will move with the inertia of their um circumstances and that's the majority of people you can metaphorically say that they are fixed by their astrological fate even if you just do it say it metaphorically and the people who don't um and and consider the actions that it takes for someone to break out of their inertia whether it's a class background or or whatever consider what it actually takes and it's essentially ritual like you're sort of daring the universe or insisting that the universe reform around you and that's very pharaonic so i don't know if i i don't think it's fixed for people in the sense i don't think the universe is at a 70% on your dial put it that way <laughs> so um let's assume that you know most everybody's at let's call that state of inertia zero where do you place yourself in distinction against that Um well so is it free will if i look at various cycle models including astrology and kind of get an understanding of the shape of my year and then just gently nudge and align and be aware of what's coming is that free will because i've seen it uh, even though i more or less let it unfold and either minimize the stuff that is not going to be pleasant or or lean into the stuff that's going to be good like am i defying fate with my free will there or am i surfing the inertia better mm that's a really good question i don't know i mean the way i think about it is that you know i'm a a 100% fate person in the sense that i think that the general shape of the thing that's coming down the pike is fixed but that i feel like you have some agency and ability to negotiate with the shape of that sure. archetype or whatever you want to call yeah. it right you know and astrologers astrologers say this all the time it's like you've got your saturn return coming are you going to take a good attitude or a bad attitude towards that and that will determine what your experience of it is so you know so i i i sort of feel like but i also think you do what i do which is trigger um because i was mm-hmm. listening to your episode with of of with Miguel where you said if you mm-hmm. get the 10 of swords you'd go out and buy 10 needles now you're kind of triggering yes, the I- outcome <laughs> so that's how yeah. i do it that's not exactly that i think that's a really great idea um but i do that mm-hmm. astrologically so if i know that if i look at the space weather and go oh this is looking quite turbulent i will trigger and hope that that satisfies the conditions yeah 10 kebabs is also really awesome yeah <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. I think so. And also, you know, and then there's the other practice which you would have heard about I do every single morning, which is, you know, I take I take the cards I get and I try to um write a little spell to help them along, right? You know, to to set the frame. See, it's I think it's a mistake to say that you know, it's it's either I'm creating a change in my uh 
external circumstances by writing the spell or not. And I think it's a mistake equally to say I'm ch- attitude only. It's somewhere in between. Yeah, right? we're not bringing. You're a language nerd, so you know that we're not bringing the right words to to this situation. And I actually, I'm quite <laughs> bullish about that changing at the moment. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff in in Psy about retrocausality and so on, because I just don't think we're using the right terms, the mo- the most accurate terms we could be to match to like how tarot works in one's life, because it appears to be a sort of retrocausal, um, causal nest or um, tangle. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like, okay, you're living in a field of meaning, your your mind is a, a meaning making machine, they're constantly interacting, you know, so so there's the whole idea of cause and effect is kind of fucked. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, and that's why um, I, I enjoy the boldness of talking to people who will read cards and say, I don't know what's going on here. Like, like <laughs> I literally don't know what's going on. I don't know how they work. Um, I don't know if they work. And, 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 and that kind of honesty, like, what is work? Are we even using the word correctly there? What we're doing is, yeah, entangling Work with, is definitely the wrong word. I yeah. don't know what the right word is, but work's definitely. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're right entangling word. with a, a sequence of symbols or um, meanings. And so how do tarot cards work is a, um, is a downstream question from how does the universe work? How do you approach meaning yes, philosophically? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and you know, and there's something about, but I really think tarot for that because can you, know, you say that again sorry we, we, and that, you've that noticed this out. as well yeah can, can oh, you repeat sorry. that again we got oh, I was just, it's uh, a terrible line this time yep. it's killing me do you know when it started oh, it was started sorry. with the Hermes Cthonio stuff so we can blame him but carry on <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I even plugged in my ethernet cable to try and help <laughs> um, yeah so yeah no I was just going to say that that tarot is a really good test case for you know reality models just because you know, I almost think, and you've talked about this in previous shows and with other guests, that, you know, you can, there are certain circumstances where tarot breaks, and that's instructive. Like, for example, if you're, um, if you're, if you're trying to do a love reading, particularly for yourself, I think you wrote about it at one time as a, a, a non-empirical data decrease in accuracy, mm. <laughs> you know, where, where because there's, because you've got skin in the game, you know, things start to no longer come through as neatly, as clearly, as whatever. I mean, I, I actually think that in all forms of sortilege, that uncertainty or randomness is itself the vehicle. And I'm not sure why. But, um, but, but I sort of feel like it has to do with maybe doing a runaround around our systems of belief, you know? I mean, I think because, like, if you think you live in a causal universe, you know, then then you're not going to believe that anything particularly useful can come out of a tarot reading because it's just random. But if you surrender to that, you know, if you surrender to the complete randomness and impossibility of the situation, then something different starts to happen. And this is why I'm a tarot reader and not an astrologer, because at some level, you know, astrology is is the celestial clockwork. You can predict, literally, where the stars are going to be, uh, except for maybe like horary techniques. It's a little bit different the way they do use that in astrology. There's, an, there's more of a sortilege component. But, you know, but, but the perfect randomness of, uh, of using cards forces you to suspend your disbelief or suspend your belief. I'm not sure which it is. So, you know, I was thinking about this, these problems of belief, and I was thinking about how uh, this is, this is hard for me, but I'm going to try to express what I'm going towards. I don't have a completely worked out thought, but, you know, I was thinking about how, like, when, when people say that they're brave, right, that doesn't mean that they're without fear. Courage is not the absence of fear, right? It's you can be brave, but you're acting in the presence of fear. And so I was thinking maybe there's a corollary in the concept of belief. Maybe belief, you know, is not the absence of doubt. 
maybe belief exists in the presence of doubt. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I that get maybe that. The, There's yeah, a Bible line for that somewhere. Faith oh, is probably. things hoped for but not yet seen. I can't remember. Catherine Fitz mentioned it the other week, and I'm like, no, that's kind of catchy. But uh, I, I know exactly what you mean. So, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, so I maybe, also we're struggling like, to use – yeah, you go. The, the, no, I was just thinking that like the complete randomness that's created when you when you do tarot it creates this sort of like perfect perfect field of doubt in which you can you know you can you can negotiate with your belief. So I don't know. I mean, I think that's like that's that's again why I wouldn't take a card out or take the pips out or you know or take chumps mm. out. It has to be. It has to be completely uncertain. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's you, you're kind of right that even if you are just thinking someone is shuffling bits of paper in front of you, uh, mm -hmm. th it is still you're still participating in a randomization process. So mm -hmm. uh, at, there is no belief system you can bring to sitting down and have someone reading your cards or you reading them for yourself that doesn't have that doesn't sort of put the universe in a blender. Uh, yeah. And I think that's interesting to, that's a good idea. That's a good thought to think with. Yeah. And you know, the thing is that like, now I'm talking specifically about sort of the divination side of tarot, because I actually believe that, you know, it's, it's constructive to use tarot magically as well. So, you know, what I encourage people to do when I'm reading for them is, I um I try to figure out how to take back the agency by figuring out uh how to talk back to tarot. So for example, um something I have have people do all the time in class or just generally people who know tarot is you know uh treat it as a language. So so for example, if you know where you're trying to get to how do you express that in tarot? Because there's there's a card for everything, right? And if you can somehow render your desire into an image, you know, surely you can use the tarot to um, to seek it. So you know, for, so for example, um, I don't know. Suppose there's a job I want to get. There there isn't at the moment, but <laughs> but if I did, I'd probably represent it with the six of pentacles because that's just what that means to me. And Suppose that, um, so, so what I would do is I would take the Six of Pentacles, I would shuffle it back into the deck, I would have a good look at it, and then I'd shuffle it back into the deck, and then I would go hunting for it. And when I found it, I would see what came before it. And that would give me some idea of next steps, or, you know, next um, correct attitudes, frames of mind that I might try to adopt to get towards my destination. So, you said the Six of Pentacles would be a desired job for you because that's what it represents for you. This is a question that I really, really want to um, drill down on. Susie, where do meanings come from? Like, you've written a whole book about meanings, so are they in the cards? Like, you, you must have the answer yeah. for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So, my Six of Pentacles is not your Six of Pentacles, correct? You know, so, um, so this is why, this is why I wrote the book, I guess, but it's, it's not for the reasons that everybody thinks. So, I don't believe that everyone needs to learn the Golden Dawn correspondences. <laughs> God, what a terrible world that would be. I mean, far from it. I think the way I think of correspondence is that they provide a framework on which some of us are going to hang our meanings. Because, you know, um, if, if you have a system of 78 cards in which the entire cosmos has to be represented, everything you know and everything you don't know too, then you're going to have to find a way to pack a lot of meanings into every card. You know, most people will be able to say, okay, two of cups, I'm falling in love, or, you know, the tower, something shocking and difficult taking place. But you know, but I don't really think most people have a clear sense of what the cards look like in their completely everyday normal lives. Like you brush cutting in the sleep. What's the card for that? 
That's That's, actual question. (laughs) Yeah, God. Um, See, I'm just, I'm still thinking Marseille or playing cards. Um, I would Mm -hmm. say it would be, God, it would be the seven of spades. Interesting. Why is that? Well, because it's sharp and it's challenging and it hurt. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Off the top of my head, my my system, I think I'd probably give it an give it a five of pentacles just because uh, just at the moment and because of your situation where you got sick, uh, it's a card of sickness and it has snow snow falling in it. So, um, but you know, on a I went with challenging sharp. So I landed on, yeah, yeah, yeah. I landed on seven of spades or swords, but you know, um, I'm still thinking playing cards at the moment, but so (laughs) yeah, but that's, that's, that's what I think is going. I think that like in order to um, figure out what is going on in, you know, to, to find a card for every single thing that happens in your life, you need some sort of system, some neural network going in your brain. Right. And I think that the correspondence is, you know, if you're halfway there already, because growing up in Western civilization, you know, I mean, it just provides a framework and, you know, it's, it makes it, it makes it feel, um, it's a really easy way to get started speaking back and forth with the language. It's like a, um, it's like a grammar, right? You know, it's like a, it's just a structure. Well, cool, Um, because I want to pick back up on that in a sec, but this leads to a a related question. So how do you break in a new deck? Because I I suspect we probably have a broadly similar, just what you said there is like a language. For me, um, and and bearing in mind, I don't, I'm I'm not sure, and we'll get to this because I think it's weird, I'm not sure how embedded in the actual um, cards the meanings are, but for each new deck, I will basically give, especially because I like the the arty ones and the themed ones and whatever, I will get a <laughs> essentially a, a keyword for each. The, the trumps are fine, but for each of the pips, because there is a lot more give in in a different artist's expression of the pips. And so I'll just sort of memorize them, right? I'll just make two mm-hmm. piles and make sure and they have a keyword. And then after that, it's just... um that's how I break in a new deck. And then I, then it sort of becomes ready to use. But what's so weird about this method is I don't actually do atomized readings. Like, it's still whatever comes immediately after the gestalts, because I've kind of got this, I don't know, remote mm-hmm. viewing way of doing it. You, you look at the deck and probably your first thought, it's, I find it's typically the second thought that's correct rather than the first. But you park the gestalt <laughs> and then, because you, you kind of, it's impossible not to have the answer in the front of your head that you think is going to happen. So I sort of park that. But then in the first couple of seconds, you just look at the cards and it's usually a yes, no. Like, And then I kind of drill down. So it's weird. I don't do an atomized reading, but I do mm. atomize meaning keywords into a new deck when I get them. How do you break in a new deck? Yeah, I know what you mean. So, um, so usually I will go card by card. I'll, I'll let my eyes go over every single card. And I don't even necessarily engage the meaning machine. I just look at it all because I think that I'm highly overdetermined as it is. And what what this deck, new deck can add to me, for me, do for me, is um, simply acquaint me with its visual language. So, uh, so, so I will run my eyes comprehensively over every card. Sometimes I will look at the book, um, depending on what kind of book it is. If it's just a little white book with not much going on, I'll just skip it. But sometimes somebody's, you know, made an effort. So then I'll look at the book. But, uh, and then if I, if I, I want to do that before I start working with it. But if I'm serious about it, you know, if we're going to go steady, (laughs) then I'll, um, then I'll make a case for it. So, you know, I make these arcana cases, uh, they're silk and brocade, cases that were actually my first uh, big step into tarot a few years back. I have this Etsy shop where I sell these very cases uh, for tarot decks. So if I really if I really care about it, I'll make a case. And then I'll start reading with it. And I will read for at least a week solid um, card of the day. And, you know, making spells from it, getting to know it, seeing how it talks, what kind of uh, what kind of personality 
it has, I guess. And then, um, and actually, I just did that with the Brady Tarot. Do you know that one? Uh, I don't think so. Oh, it's quite beautiful. Um, it's a it was a Kickstarter deck uh, by a by a young woman named Emmy Brady, and uh, and it's I you know you might like it. It's uh, it's it's she did uh, woodcuts or I don't know. I th- oh, I do know it. Was, oh, yeah. I do actually. My uh, my tarot neighbor, a neighbor Avalon, uh, was telling me about yeah. it. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rachel Pollack wrote the book, and uh, and it was it's so good that I spent three weeks with it, not not one, um, because I like it so much. So you know, so so I will really sit there and just get to know it, and you know, and just see what it has to say. So that's my process. It's sort of card by card, case it if I like it, and then read with it for at least a week. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, yeah. For me, like I want to come back to where meanings come from because I, particularly with the um, Sibylla stuff, and also the last year or so doing, or ten months or so doing the Normand, uh, I think Camelia is right when she says that the meanings aren't atomized, and she says she would find it unbelievably boring as a tarot reader if you have like fixed. Or a card reader, yes. if you have fixed meanings and you you, put, you pull one up and go, oh, that's an argument between friends, and then we move on to the next card, and that's it. So you just oh, have yeah. this these little dots of of meanings that are essentially arbitrary. But here's where it gets weird, right? So I, uh, the meaning will emerge, and it will be different every single spread because if you look at it in totality, is where you're going to get the actual answer. It's sort of made of the things underneath it, but it's also made of what the cards look like and 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 the mm-hmm. preponderance of a particular number or color or whatever. So, at the top level, it's not the sort of great big book of correspondences uh, that you have. But here's where it gets weird, right? So we can kind of almost philosophically yeah. mm-hmm. state that meaning. I don't even like saying this, but it's almost like meaning is arbitrary. But when I email to say, actually, Susie, I want you to come on the show and talk about this. Here's where it gets weird or what I'm trying to solve, because <laughs> I think that's right. From a fortune telling perspective, I think it is, um, it's in that emergent synthesis of the cards is where you get the best divination rather than little atomized ones. However, if you go, and and which is a thing I really like doing uh, with the Oculi Occultalti Tarot, for instance, this quarter I've been using mm-hmm. them for journeying, and that's when I emailed you, because uh, on uh, via a process of journeying on these cards, I would see things in active imagination, mm-hmm. and then I would go into the book and go backwards through the stuff that you have and go, that's weird that it kind of lines up with some like decanal imagery that is in your book. And so yeah. what the hell's going on there? Where if the if the meanings aren't in the cards, and I don't think they are from a fortune telling perspective, but if you use them from right. a journeying perspective, all these correspondences become quite useful after the fact. Yes, yes. I've had that experience as well. And I think, you know, being a fairly left brain person, it's been really important for me the last year or so to um to cultivate the uh, I don't know if you want to call I guess right brained uh, methodology. So journeying for sure. And that's actually why I originally signed up in the membership area of your of your website, uh, because I wanted to take the journey and journeying course. And uh, so journeying has been really important to me dreaming going into the dreaming because you know you can you can read symbols all you like you know in the cards and you can uh, analyze it six ways from sunday but every night you go on an adventure that <laughs> you know is is more complex more subtle less determined and you know more magical in a way than than um than the techniques that we use in cards. So so it's been really important to me to sort of go back and forth between the two and encourage whatever network is building to build because I'm not going to know what it is. And what I found is that there's more and more um, conversation between those two parts of myself over time. Uh, good. You know, and uh, every once in a while, I'll actually see a tarot reading in a dream, and I'm like, "What are you doing there?" You know, that's yeah. that's just like mm, completely unnecessary. <laughs> but you know, and I and I think that that's you know, there there's something about there's something one can learn from journeying from any kind of journey work that I think improves your tarot, which is 
the state of mind that you put yourself in, uh, which I'm just starting to realize now, is very different. You know, mm. it's very different. And it's like a just different period, you know, full stop. You know, it's like, I, I realize that when I'm, when I'm reading for other people, which is extremely important for me to do that, because, you know, that's, that's the whole point to develop, to develop the art. So I read for people every week and I realize that when it's going right, you know, it's, it's a little like dreaming. There's a, a feeling in the body. There's a, there's a, uh, I don't know, a shift in perspective. There's a, there's definitely a loss of memory, <laughs> just like in, just like in dreaming. But you know, but there's a. I remember I told you about that buzz that I started feeling with, with tarot, and it's it's more like listening and less like talking. I guess. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you know, and that's what that's what I that's what I kind of keep coming back to. You know, when I'm reading for for people it's it's i have no desire to be a person who gives people advice you know out of my life experience i i'm only interested in in helping in you know in this way because i know that it's not just me it's um it's something much bigger than myself that seems to be uh seems to materialize in the intentional space between the two people in the reading yeah, so that kind of brings me back to we're in this weird situation where the meanings aren't embedded in the cards, and, and they're just not. Like, mm -hmm. um, you kind of create your own web of meaning in it, but yet the symbols are real. So I think that's mm -hmm. what I've landed on, because I'm trying to work out, we know where most of these correspondences came from, and we know why, uh, you know, Atea and whatever put them together, and he probably... Sorry, you you dropped out for a second. Could you could you back up for a second? You dropped we, out. We know the history of where the um, traditional associations with each card comes from. We know it fairly precisely. Like we know these mm -hmm. ones come from Atea, and he probably picked them up from. Or um, essentially, it's kind of mansplaining. Frankly, he would have. Uh, he took <laughs> he took gypsy women's kind of arbitrary correspondences, which they made up because people wouldn't tell them what was going on in their lives, and kind of systematized it. So we know that they don't actually meaning isn't embedded in the cards but the symbols are real and i think that's my solve for what's going on here because i i like the synthesis fortune telling aspect when you're doing divination but as you say tarot cards will show up in your dreams or if you do a journey sequence or active imagination sequence along the trumps they'll start showing up in real life like it's it's weird and that's right. the bit that i'm trying to like i'm trying to work out what my one sentence is about because i don't want people to the value of your book and it's a really it's it's an, a remarkable achievement it's a really good update on you need this on a magic on a magician's bookshelf you need like a whole i need a book where i know for certain i can get correspondences across all this kind of astrological and and, and everything else stuff for a particular card and and, and backwards so if i want a tarot correspondence for the decans yeah. like i can do that as well right so all good mm -hmm. um but i don't want people to think that there is something, and this is, I, you need you need to help me with this. I don't want people to think that <laughs> all of those things are embedded in each card and you have to memorize them because I don't think they're in the card. Right. I think they're in the no. universe. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's true. And, you know, but I think that, I think that if you call on them, you know, if you use the correspondence, if you, if you, you know, take your conscious left brain mind and go look them up and do something with them, you know, I think that you're basically red booking your tarot. You're making something happen, right? So, you know, you can you can call on it even though it's not in you and it's not in the cards, it's somewhere else. Okay. And because I, I like I devil's know, advocate, like I, I get it, mm -hmm. but devil's advocate there would mm -hmm. be saying, Are you doing that or are you actually just creating which you should do anyway, we were just talking about it, or are you just creating <laughs> A, um, a mesh of meaning inside your own head that is unattached to the symbols. Because that's, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I don't, I, I wonder, can the symbols even be tamed? Um, you're probably right. I think that might be my solve for it. I just, I don't, it's really confusing after a, after a year of sort of much more fortune telling approaches to kind of come back to journeying on this remarkable deck 
uh, and and then have mm-hmm. all the symbols, not all of them, but have some unusual alignments uh, with traditional associations. Like, ah, oh, damn it! I thought I had this. I thought I had my opinion on this sorted, and now I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I had sort of a a weird moment that broke my model this week too. After I got your Sibylla cards, you know, I had. Uh, I was looking through them and I, I couldn't help myself. I, I did some spreadsheeting because I, I wanted to see how they lined up with the Etea meanings. And, you know, and honestly, there wasn't a ton of overlap, but where they overlapped, they were consistent. So, uh, for example, and I wanted to see, you know, also any sort of um, could you translate it back into tarot? And the answer is kind of no, but, um, but there were some weird overlaps. So, for example, five of hearts. Uh, it's, it says, uh, I think it has marriage on it. And, uh, and this is something that freaked me out because, you know, the five of cups, which is its analog in tarot is, is a, is a really sad card. You know, it's got the mm. guy staring out down at his spilled cups with two in the background. He's got the cloak of mourning on. He's, he's, he's a gloomy Gus. And I, uh, and you know, and I like everyone, I read it as some sort of loss or disappointment It's literally the Lord of disappointment. It's Mars uh, in the in the uh, first decan of Scorpio and all that that implies. But, you know, over time, over years, I'm really talking 20 years, that card has come up in some very strange situations that I was at a loss as to how to parse. And the situation was that I would see men getting it before they got married. Yeah. This happened like this is, four I've, times, five times, yep. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is. I, I'm, I'm, you carry on with the story, but I'm waiting to jump in because I hope you. I think we're going to land on the same place. I have. I have a similar experience with the Sibylla card you're talking about. But keep going. Yeah, it happened to my husband before we got married in 1998. And that's what you know. That's not. That's not the card I want you to find on the street. <laughs> but over time, reading for people, complete strangers over and over, I see it happen. And it's not that the men are about to, uh, you know, have their hearts broken. It's not that. I, you know, I'll, I'll interpret it as maybe the loss of s- one sense of self before taking on another, you know, which is all fine and good. It's interpretation. But why then? Why is there this cardomantic meaning of marriage that's associated with that I did not know about until I saw the friggin' card? Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the the kind of relationship between the sort of classical association of the insets in in both, the, especially the Sibylla, because it's it the first time you look at it, it's sort of the same with Lenormand, but the first time you look at it, you're like, what are you thinking <laughs> to have these two? And and the trick is, well, actually, you have to find how those two fit and you lose your circle of friends when you get married. So yes. that's, it is a disruption or a loss of friendship, but it doesn't mean you're not gaining other things, but that life, particularly if it's spilled cups, if we're going back to say, wait, Smith, like there is less partying with the boys. Well, yes, but I still think that that's almost, uh, it's almost, I think it's still overdetermined. I still think that there's something about that card and it's not the, you know, marriage is loss. It's this sort of comes down to something else that I think about the cards, which is not something I've worked out either. But, but I, I think that one thing that really confuses people about reading cards generally is that particularly if they start with Rider Waite Smith is that a lot of the cards seem to have a strongly negative or positive affect. And whereas I think that each card, you know, I really truly believe that they don't, they don't necessarily manifest as negative or positive. They bring up the issue and it can come out oh, sure. at one end of the spectrum or the other. So you're, you know, the thing that's you opposite. Might, you're also team. Um, this is the other thing that I need to ban is reversals. So nope. <laughs> if your card is upside down, just turn it the right way because, like, as you say, an issue, the range of meaning will show up there. And that's actually what I quite like about the fortune telling ones because you, you look at the, the quote unquote pictures first and then the inset, if it's not clear, then the insets allow you that extra layer of potential meaning. And then there's the third one of the synthesis, but I agree completely. Like it's, it's an issue. It's not generally. It's an issue. Yeah. And I actually do use reversals, but I don't read them as opposite. I, I use reversals to 
add spin. But, you know, and another thing, well, there's it's a whole subject of its own, but for example, reversals allow you to see if someone's looking away rather than towards, right? You know, there's just like a number of things you can do with reversals that are not related to opposition. Sure, sure, sure. But um, I still don't yeah. use them. I don't use houses in <laughs> Lenormand. I think they're garbage as well. Obviously, everyone's different, but like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. And there's no, you know, this is what's so funny. I was thinking about this the other day. There's, you can't say that there's a right way and a wrong way to do this stuff. You know, I mean, I was, I, <laughs> I have this class, as I mentioned, and, and, uh, you know, I really wanted to engage with the students and give them feedback. But I was like, what the hell is grading in tarot? I gave somebody 500 out of 100 today because, <laughs> you know, you know, because they, they tried really hard. You know, I mean, what is, there is no right answer. So, I mean, yeah. there, you know, when you're dealing with uh, with meaning and subjectivity, you can't, you can't, you can't say A plus or F. <laughs> no, exactly, and and I, that's the the glorious chaos of of its history, and and this is the weird p- bit of how I fit meanings into the story of tarot rather than have them kind of emerge from the gloom of history embedded as meaning these things, right? Instead, it's not that. Like, we know that they they came from tavern games and, and, and um, mm-hmm. that sort of stuff, and that's really exciting to me. And over the course of its journey like along the timeline tarot has picked these things up which means it hasn't it's it has its own philosophical validity even if it mm-hmm. doesn't even if they haven't emerged into history with the meanings fully embedded in the cards themselves it's something that's happened to tarot over over time and so it has its validity like it, you can use it you just you can use it without mm-hmm. having to say well this is always what the five of cup means like it's it's just baked into oh, that yeah. you know and i i like that i think this is um i think if we can relativize meaning it might actually become funnily enough more meaningful or more useful well i totally see what you're getting at i mean i it's preposterous, you know. I mean, it, there are people who will say you can't read the cards this way or you can't read them that way, and of course you can. Of course you can. You know, it's 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 a it's a private transaction between you and your divination. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, um, I knew this was going to be a great chat. I knew uh, I, I, <laughs> I needed someone to kind of help me unpick what where I put meaning and how I think about it because uh, you know I'm. A, a ghetto Jungian, um, so I'm, I'm all about symbolism. But I'm like, but the, the meaning isn't in the cards. So I think I think we've I made know. good progress. I've helped very much. You're- I think I've just created more and more gray areas. No, no, like, <laughs> I, I love gray areas. <laughs> <laughs> and the book is it's it's a genuinely useful update of the kind of books you're supposed to have on 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 a shelf. The sort of magician's table kind of classic books. It's it's a it's a really good achievement. Uh, really diligent stuff. I learned a lot. From, like, you just keep turning the pages, going, oh, oh, I did not know that, and that's going to be useful at some point. It's certainly been useful from a and and surprising from a journeying perspective. But uh, yeah, congratulations I, on the book. Because I, I wrote it really not because you know one doesn't write books to um, become famous or make money. You know, I really did it just because I needed the book. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> That's that's you know? absolutely the right um, reason to do so. But you've mentioned your show, Susie, and you've mentioned the website and so on. For people who want to know more, obviously the book will be in the show notes. But where else do they go? How do they find you? What's going on? Oh, and the Hermes Cathonios um, or for Kim will be in the show notes. I remembered. What else? Yes. Well, everything, including the videos, um, which are really just a once in a while, just for fun type thing, everything is now finally centralized on my website, www.tsusanchang.com. Uh, the podcast has its own Patreon site, which is uh, www.patreon.com slash fortunes wheelhouse. Uh, Etsy shop has its own uh, site www.etsy.com slash shop slash tarotista and then there's um i'm trying to i'm trying to do twitter i'm trying to do instagram but i only seem to have one one ch- social media channel at a time so i'm on facebook <laughs> and uh and probably the the only place the best place to find me there would be um at the fan group that sort of coalesced around Fortune's Wheelhouse, a bunch of listeners set up a page, and it's a really terrific bunch of people. It's called Fortune, and uh, it's like 300, 400 people. No, 300 people, I think, and uh, all all wonderful tarot nerds. 
Awesome. And I'm there all the time. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Well, of course, this will all be in the show notes. And, uh, and yeah, thank you very much. This is a great chat. Oh, thank you so much, Gordon. And thank you for literally, I wa- I've been wanting to thank you for years for all you do, because, you know, I think you, your show, you and your show give so many of us kind of a permission structure to do this work. And it's, it, it is completely absent in most of our lives. <laughs> but, but you're holding a place that's incredibly valuable um, for, for those of us who uh, struggle within our communities to do the work we're drawn to. Oh, that's really, really nice. I haven't heard it put that way. I, that's a very nice thing to hear. Now I'm going to go out and destroy myself and more plants with their brush cutter, <laughs> and I'll I'll be like, ah, oh, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't get sick this time. <laughs> no, no, promise. All right, Susie, thank you very much. Amazing chat. Thank you, Gordon. Well, not only was that super fun, as tarot discussions usually are, it was also personally useful in sliding a few things into place in my head. What I was and am trying to solve, to my own satisfaction, is how the tarot can be such an exquisite entry into the imaginal or collective unconscious, or whatever you want to call it, without sliding into that a historical essentialism and superstition, frankly, of the meanings being somehow baked into and fixed into the cards themselves. And to some extent, it doesn't matter if you choose to think that, except that, in my humble considered opinion, it leads to worse and less accurate readings. So there's a functional reason, if you will, for solving this to your own satisfaction. Particularly if you use fixed spreads along with fixed meanings, you end up with this sort of, or at least you risk ending up with this sort of unconnected collection of meaning blobs where you just sort of wait for the argument between friends or new business opportunity card to show up and then point to it and say yes or no. From a more fortune-telling perspective, the quote-unquote answer will emerge as a synthesis of the cards you turn up, and most often visually first, with the traditional meanings then sort of being available for you to drop down into extra levels of detail or clarification regarding your answer. So, meaning isn't in the cards, but instead consider the possibility that the archetypes described on them have chosen to express themselves in our world as, among other things, myriad expressions and depictions found across thousands of decks. So that's where a book like Susie's can be so useful. There are any number of magical reasons for having a diligently compiled correspondence set without having to decide whether they are useful for you in a specifically fortune-telling capacity. So check out the show notes for more info on the book and Susie in general. Subscribe to the show in your preferred podcatcher. Follow Rune Soup on Facebook or visit runesoup.com and find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.